So welcome everyone to the Future Work Scotland. Good to see you all. Um, I'm your host, Sathpal Singh. Nobody calls me Sath. I'm joined by my co-organizer, Donald Henderson. Um, it's lovely to be doing this. This is our September offering. I think you've got a, a real treat in store. We had a wonderful conversation with, with Niels offline. Uh, just the usual formalities before we, we get into it. Um, we do have a code of conduct. In short, we simply say, look, you know, just, just, just be respectful to one another. And everyone have an excellent time. That's all we ask. Um, Niels has got no slides this evening, so that's really cool. So he is going to be making great use of his flip chart. So we're going to keep it pretty informal, interactive. We'll stop, we'll take questions as we go. If you hear something and you've got a burning question, please drop it into, into our chat facility. Prefix it with a Q so we can spot it. And then if it's a good moment, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give the question to, to Niels and then we'll see how we go. And we'll do our usual sort of announcements and updates, et cetera, at the end, as we as always do for those of you who've been here before, uh, and a number of you have. And if it is your first time, a very well welcome to you. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to welcome uh, Niels uh, for leg into the session. Hopefully I didn't get his surname wrong too badly there. We did talk about it offline. Uh, it's, it's a cracking looking surname. Um, because this session's been in for a while, um, Niels has done some incredible work over the last 20 years or so. I love the fact that he calls himself a leadership philosopher. I do really like that. And an entrepreneur, and he's written countless books, 10, I believe. Uh, and uh, we do have a few of them. Donald's normally got the books. He's holding them up. I don't know if he's got one with him there. There you go, see? As if by magic. Um, so he's done some great work in this space. Uh, and he's also the founder of the Beta Codex Network, amongst other things. Uh, and in this session, we're going to be learning all sorts of things around how to go and organising ourselves around complexity. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Niels because I think this will be a fantastic session. Floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Seth. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So thank you for inviting me. When when the guys invited me, it, it this was like it was like nine months ago or so, or last year. I'm not sure. It was in a, a long time ago. I, I I wasn't sure if the day would happen. Uh, but he, here we are, and um, I have something like 80 minutes uh, with you, or we have 80 minutes, if you like, if you don't drop out. My idea for this is the following. I will try to stir you up a little bit. I will try to lovingly provoke you, thought provoke you, so to speak. Of course, this is entirely voluntary. You may not be, you feel, may not feel, you know, stirred or irritated or confused or in interested at all. It's voluntary. And here's the thing. We do not have to agree on things, you know. This is not a we have to agree on everything session. This is the session I want to. I want your. I want you to feel a little bad after this and 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 be in disagreement with me. So don't believe in anything that I say. Let's not agree, but let's have let's have a little chat in the in, in throughout these eighteen minutes or so. Uh, of course, I want to talk a little to you. I want to I want to uh, share a couple of ideas, which I think are pretty pretty progressive probably today I hope I think I'm, I'm quite convinced they're progressive um, and we can have some interaction uh, the guys will read out your questions in the chat aloud and um, again don't believe in anything that I say but just just I mean Seth already introduced me a little bit but, but be aware I'm a consultant so we should never believe in consultants right thank you also to the sponsors I know that Martin is a sponsor who else is a sponsor Martin say hi Woo! No. Martin also is a great guy, by the way. Uh, who else is a sponsor? Any other sponsors? No, Mar Martin's our, our, our only sponsor. Yeah, yeah. Martin, very good. So thank you for putting in all this money. I mean, I got a huge fee for this session. Huge, huge. You wouldn't believe how, how big the fee is. Is there any fee? But let's, let's uh, anyway, anyway, sponsors are very important. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Martin. And also for you know, introducing me to the guys. So um, I hope you will have some interest in the concept that I will share with you. I want to, I want, I will, most of the concepts that I will share with you, I will eventually write them or yes, yeah, well, put them on the flip chart, but very, very, in a very dirty way, you know, nothing, nothing sophisticated. So this is what I want to be, would like to begin with, um, the mess you are in. Uh, okay, so how do I know that you are in a mess? 
we don't have to agree, by the way, don't believe in anything that I say, but I'm quite sure most of you are in a mess. Um, by the way, who's a consultant? If you are a consultant, put something, a yes or a why or so in the, in the chat, please. Consultants, how many consultants do we have? Do we have just a few? Or if you have something like a consultant, trainer, coach, and so Martin is one, of course, yes. Consultants, consultants, many consultants, right? Okay, okay. Do we have real people as well? Real people put real in or are in the chat? Okay. I mean, we, so I, I guess I guess we might have a 50-50 share or something like that, if I followed that correctly. Um, but here's the thing. Either way, if you are a consultant, trainer, coach, or anything, or a real person, yep, very good. Uh, are somebody's real, Corin is real, good, okay. Regardless if you are a real person or consultant, trainer, coach, you are in a mess. How do I know? Well, because most organizations are in a mess. Your own organizations or your clients. For some of you, your organization and your clients might be in a mess. But what is the mess? I think we have to start with this. This is also, I think, um, a couple of... I'm, I'm a real consultant. Very good. I'm happy about having Joe here, who's a real consultant. Of course, we are all real people, but... This is just I, I don't want to stop you. I don't want to stop you, Neil. But Martin has got your hand up. Is that deliberate? Did you want to? No, it was to answer Neil's question. It's okay. I just didn't ah. put it down. Right. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So okay. what? What are you? No, you are a consultant, Martin, right? Yeah, I'm a consultant. I'm not a real person. Yeah, exactly. Um, but then again, you know what this is about, right? We have sensed it. So here's the thing I would like to start with: the invitation of reflecting again about the situation we are in. Some of you are agilists. I know Martin is one. I sometimes consider, consider myself an agilist. Hello, agilists. I mean, scrum people and so on. And I think uh, agile set out to fight waterfall. The question is, did we, did we win or did we lose? I would say, don't believe in what I'm saying. We don't have to agree. I think we didn't quite win the, the war against waterfall. Not at all. I think the empire back and very effectively and now we have safe which is maybe waterfall quadrupled or whatever it is uh, I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if we slayed the dragon of command and control because this I think was always the real enemy if we if you are an agilist or if you if you work in organizational development such as myself I consult mostly in change organizational development stuff and so I mean we cannot put we can put all, ca all kinds of tags on it, leadership, decentralization, self-organization. At the, at the start, when I started this work, we called our solution Beyond Budgeting. By the way, co-founded by a um, dear friend of mine, Robin Fraser, a Scotsman. So uh, that is how I got into the game. We called the alternative to what most organizations had, Beyond Budgeting. You can, you can look that up. Maybe you've heard of it. Um, that's how I started getting into, into the game. But let, let me let me first talk about the left side of it. You might call this the pyramid model of organizing, and we might call this on the right the peach model of organizing. And here's the hypothesis. Don't believe in what I say. I'm still right, but don't you don't have to believe it. There are just two modes of organizing. I mean, organizations have just two, there are two basic models. And this is an invitation to reflect. I'm not saying it's true. I believe it's right, but I'm not saying it's true. But uh, here's the thing, probably, probably, or maybe, there are just two foundational way of organizing, uh, the pyramid and the peach. Sometimes I call this on the left alpha, and the model on the right, I call this beta. Beta is rare, hard to find. Few organizations have it. It's for the few, so to speak. You have it. Most organizations have good old alpha. We all know how alpha works, by the way. Beta, still a big mystery. And here you can see what have I achieved in 20 years of work around this. Is swearing okay in this? Uh, Seth, can I swear a little bit? I've achieved fucking nothing. You know, absolutely nothing. I'm I'm the worst marketer in the world. I should I should probably learn a little bit more from uh, Jürgen Appelo, my great friend Jürgen Appelo. I think he's not here, but he's a great marketer. He's great. His models, well, I do not agree with all of them, but great marketing. So I, my marketing sucks. But again, that's why I'm preaching to you. 
<laughs> of course, I'm not preaching. I'm inviting you to reflect. But here's the thing. I suggest to you in this session that alpha is still everywhere. Waterfall software development, by the way, is just a feeble shadow, a feeble attachment to alpha organization, a detail, a, a bit of alpha is waterfall software development. This is an outcome, a child of alpha organizations is waterfall software development. Command and control based software development, we might say. There is an alternative, but here's the thing. I would argue that what the software development movement, the agile software development movement, and with all its sub movements, uh, DevOps, of course, uh, and so on. What we have achieved is that we have brought a lot of little islands of happiness to us alpha organizations. You may not like this hypothesis, and I'm not saying it's true. I believe it's true, but we do not have to agree. Don't believe in anything that I say. We have What we have achieved is to better alpha a little bit. That's certainly we have achieved that. Yeah. We have brought islands of happiness, scrum teams, you know, pilots and so on, so to alpha organizations. Sometimes we even have helped to create larger islands of happiness, you know, entire areas, so whole bunches of software development teams we have made more agile and so on. But I believe, I'm not sure if you agree with me, that we haven't done, we haven't achieved the big transformation. Yet. We haven't taken entire organizations to a better place. We are still not quite there yet. We have done good. The agile movement has done good and so on. Uh, and, and of course, consultants like some of you and, and, and myself, we have improved organizations, helped organizations in this condition um, for decades. But I'm, I think the real game is in doing the transformation to this thing here, to the Peach model, or however you want to call it, or complete agility, or ho ho holistic agility, however you might want to call it, to actual self organization or to make it more radical to coherent self-organization that is this model I, I believe total or coherent self-organization i think we haven't achieved that by the way looking back historically a little more there have been other useful movement like movements like agile there has been lean of course there has been tqm the total quality movement several movements i think have tried to open our eyes to this grand transformation might call it like that but all these movements at some point have fallen short to our expectations so we get better in the old model from the industrial age that is alpha and here's the thing about alpha that i would like to highlight this session again don't believe what i'm saying you don't have to believe what i'm saying but um i would like to invite you to think it through a little bit the problem with alpha is not that managers think managers are not the problem. A and managers are not the problem. Do you see it? I believe managers are not the problem. I do not believe that people, I mean, real people, real people, real people, not the problem either. I think that people are not the problem. But here's the thing this model is infested with command and control. And what does that mean? If managers do not want command control, if they don't want suck, if they are not the problem, then why does the model suck? It is based, don't believe in what I'm saying, what I'm saying. It's based on the wrong assumptions. One of the assumptions is that the world is complicated. Complicated. Oh, now I can invite you to what is the opposite of complicated? Everybody can can say, can can answer except Martin. I think Martin should know. What are the others? If, if complicated is a thing, then what is the opposite? If complicated is blue, then what is red? Any guesses? Simple? No, 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 no. Simple. Here's the thing. Simple, complex. Complex is correct. But let's, ah, oh, ah. There's this guy from Wales who says that there are, oh, several domains in the world, the complicated, the complex, the simple and the chaotic. That's not true, of course. It's scientific bogus. The complicated, if you know, turns simple. Don't believe in what I'm saying, and don't, don't believe the Welsh guy, even less, you know? But here's the thing. The complicated turns simple if you know it, if you have the recipe. 
for to bake to, to, to make the, the, the yeah. to make the cookie or so, then it turns simple. So with the recipe with knowledge, information that you assimilate, with knowledge, the complicated turns simple. Yeah. For the beginner who doesn't have a clue, who doesn't have the knowledge, it's complicated, but it turns simple once you know. The complex, does it turn simple? Never ever. Because here's the thing. We don't have to discuss if the guy from Wales is right or if I'm right. I'm just offering you, I'm just suggesting this distinction to you, which is essential. Yeah. And you can explain, you can rule the world with this distinction. You don't need the other guy's model. Complex things are alive, not necessarily in a biological sense, but the interactions between the parts change. So, for example, a society, politics, markets, companies, teams, people, plants, animals, honey. Do anybody here has children or loved ones, things that run around and so on? Complex things, yeah? they suck. Why do complex systems suck occasionally? I mean, we love them, but occasionally they suck because complex systems produce surprise. And surprise sometimes sucks. Yeah, We dislike it. When a complex system produces surprise markets, the weather, climate change, and so on, for example, compared climate, very complex system, uh, then surprise happens and we do not always like surprise. So surprises, we can only confront them with ideas, only people generate ideas and the complicated can be confronted with knowledge. Okay, here's the thing. Here's the thing about alpha or pyramid or command and control systems. Work perfectly in, if under the condition that blue, no or little red. If you have very little or no complexity, then this kind of organizational system in which people at the top steer the organization from the top down, you have the thinking at the top and just doing, 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 doing at the bottom, then the steering works. So command and of control organizations, Tayloristics, Tayloristic organizations are based on the assumption that they are Newtonian systems, complicated systems that you can steer from the top down, which is why planning is so important. Oh, and giving people individual targets and incentives. So steer, steer, steer. Get, wrap the individual, individual by the balls, have performance appraisal, all kinds of punishments. It's, it's organizing by fear. Uh, that's what command and control is. Yeah? Works beautifully. It's inhumane, of course, in a way, but it works beautifully if there is little or no complexity. If the market, if markets are complicated, this works. So in Scotland and everywhere around the world, this has worked rather beautifully until the 1970s or 80s. And then markets turned red, first reddish, and then really red in the 1970s and 80s, 80s. So this model has collapsed. And this is where we are standing. This is why. We have seen such an inflow of, you know, organizational change movements, new tools, new ways of, or the call for new leadership, new managing, new work. It's become louder and ever more shrieking because we need to overcome a model that's dead, deceased. It's like that parrot in the in the sketch by Monty Python's Flying Circus, right? Do you remember the sketch? Guy comes into the into the pet shop with a dead monk, a dead monkey, not a dead parrot, and 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 complains that it's dead. And the the seller says it's not dead. Yeah, it's stone dead. That's what command and control alpha is. It's stone dead. Or you might call it more precisely, it's zombie method. Yeah, it wants to bite everybody. You know, it wants to bite agilists and leaners and everyone. You know, it bites managers and it's bite. It keeps biting people at work. And it has been doing so for 50 years. I was born in 1971, 51 years ago, that sucks. But for, for that, for more than 50 decades, this has been a dead horse that we've been riding. We are trying to implement, improve what's gone already. I will give you one, one example from the 1990s, early 1990s, I think. Uh, a company based in, in Sweden and Switzerland, they came up with a new way of improving this a lot and make it more fit for complexity, which was really a thing at the time. They said, oh, this makes this model will become much more complexity robust or something if you, you need more than just one line of command and, and steering. You know, you have the pyramid. That's OK, they said at the time. Let's see if you know the name of the concept still. 
we don't, let's, oh, this is ABB, by the way, was the name of the company. Azia Braun Bovary from uh, Sweden, the CEO was a Swede at the time. So he said, let's not have just one pyramid. Let's put another pyramid on top of that with another line of command and steering. And the great organization, ABB, they actually had a third pyramid also put in. How is this method called? You can write it down in the chat if you like. What's the name of this method that came up in 1990 or so? Became a super success, matrix management, matrix organization. And of course, in the last couple of years, we have seen hipsterized versions of this coming up. The Spotify model is nothing, uh, the unfix model, or even safe is not, nothing different. All the scaling networks actually are doing exactly the same thing. Stack pyramid over pyramid to make it more, yeah. To make it more what actually? Don't believe in anything that I say, that I say. But we didn't make organizations more complexity robust or more complex, complex internally or less complicated internally. This is more of the same. It's like the door is closed, so you push the door knob harder. Have you ever done this? We sometimes do this, right? That's what I've, we've been doing for 50 years, 40, 50 years now. We've been pushing the same stupid steering door knob of command and control harder and harder and harder and rebaptizing this, these concepts over and over. It's a really sad story, story until this point. Questions, comments, we don't have to agree. Before I talk about the, the good that's out there, let's first disagree or discuss or ask other questions there. Um, no, no comments yet. No yes. comments, you just make a, made a list, wrote the name of the guy from Wales a couple of times, Matrix, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, so let's talk about because this is, this is not a solution yet, right? This is just ah, complaining, whining, and that was so bad. Any comment? All right. Have we, I'm not sure if we have an agreement. This is so you got a question. Yeah, okay. Wayne's so asking, how is Spotify just another matrix? How is it just another matrix? That's a nice question, Wayne. Of course, I'm a consultant, so I'd like to turn the question around. How is it not? When I saw it the first time, I thought, oh, what the fuck? This is matrix reloaded. <laughs> it's just... Flips, plops, knobs, pipes, splits, flips, and flops. So you have new, you have new nomenclature, new words for always the same thing, you know. And you have. Oh, I give you another another example that that stirs me up and that still embarrasses me every day. Process management. Yeah. So when you create process managers, you have just instead of just having bosses at the top steering down, you have also process people steering process from in this visual, which is stupid, but let's put it like this: from the left to right or the right to left. Yeah. So process management is also the same idea of multidimensional steering, you know, and whenever we, any agile scaling framework really does the same, the solution that comes up is always, we don't have to read about that, but even in agile scaling, what you always see popping up over and over again is the idea of, you know, stacking hierarchy. We always stack hierarchy. It's always the same thing. And ultimately, people at the top or teams at the top or roles at the top or whatever is at the top has the right to steer through control of time, control of resources, control of jobs, targets, user stories, whatever it is. It's always the same thing of steering. But here's the worst, I think, in what we have, what has happened in the last 50 years. We haven't gotten rid of anything. We are not, we are exactly the opposite of physics because in physics, if you have a great idea, let's say you're Albert Einstein, you have a great idea, you have to struggle for a couple of years and people will hate you and so on. But at a certain point, there is insight happening and the old concept, it goes away because it's considered old fashioned and wrong, you know? Yeah. That's, what, that's what happened to Isaac Newton. It happened to all, you know, physics people, math people in the world. But in our world, organizations, it's not like that. Garbage is stacked up on garbage and nothing ever fades away. Nothing ever fades away. Sometimes we give new names to old concepts. Don't believe in what I'm saying. Think for yourself, observe for yourself. But um, if you look at a new concept and it still has steering inside and steering means some people thinking and steering and some people just receiving orders. You know, it's command control. It's just a rehash of the old alpha Taylorist model. By the way, Taylorism or alpha or command control also comes with functional division. 
a very important concept, functional division. So you have, if you have a company, if you see a company that has a sales department, you know it's an alpha organization. If you see a company that has a logistics department, a procurement department, a marketing department, you know it's functionally divided, so it is alpha. You don't have to ask. If you see a company that has budgeting or budgets, this is, of course, how I got into the game. I was a financial controller at the time, 20 years ago. And uh, in the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, we argued, if you took out budgeting, what would happen? First, we asked, what's the worst that can, can happen? And then what other things will happen around it? How will organizations transform? And here's the thing. Hold it at last. How much time did I spend to talk about the problem? Almost half an hour, 20 minutes, okay. What's the alternative, you might ask? What's the model that's fit for complexity and fit for human beings? And here's the thing, we know exactly how it works. Not because I found it all, I figured it out, but it was found by, embarrassingly, it was found by Robin Fraser, Jeremy Hope, and Peter Bunce, guys from the UK, uh, over 20 years ago, because they, the first full insight into how this model worked, they didn't have the illustration at the time, but the first case that they found that had in its entirety embedded the principles of beyond budgeting, as we then called it. Now we call it the beta codex principles. So if you are interested, visit the beta codex.org website if you like. But you don't have to, I will explain it anyway. The first company in which my colleagues at the time, 20 years back, exactly 22 years back to be, to be fair, they found that at a bank called Hundreds Bank. Of course, if you live in Britain, you have heard of this bank. I think they're pretty successful in the UK. And of course, even more traditionally successful in Scandinavia. Hundreds Bank was the first one that gave them total clarity, so to speak, about how this model worked. So what did they find at Hamilton's Bank? No budgeting for already 35 years. Now it's over 50 years of no budgeting. So no budgeting, no annual planning there. And here's the thing. You wouldn't find traditional departments there. Only three layers of hierarchy in spite of around 11,000 people. Not sure how much they have right now. I check this number occasionally, but not all the time. So quite a, quite a, quite a sizable organization. Three levels of hierarchy. No incentive system, no bonus system, no centralized steering, no performance appraisal system uh, of individuals, you know, no fixed targets, no budgets, no strategic planning. What the hell, right? You might wonder. And at the time, the guys, my colleagues at the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, they figured out, okay, there are organizations that are not steered from the inside out, that, but that let themselves steer from the outside in. How does that work? Imagine, an organization, not like a pyramid, like a power power chart, power or, or chart, based on who is whose boss, who has power over whom. But imagine this as an organization in which, well, first of all, the market is red. Can we agree that markets are red these days? For every organization, even social or social companies, hospitals, schools, public sector, all of it. Even for the, for the NHS, you know, National, National Health Services in the, in the UK, uh, so public sector, Greenpeace, the markets are red. They are complex, okay? So there's a brutal consequence for organizations. It's a, the sphere of activity where the organization meets the market, uh, the interface with the market, so to speak, steering happens. And it's not from the inside out, it's from the outside in. So in red markets, Complex markets. The market takes over the steering, and the market steers the periphery, as this part of the organization is called. Periphery. Let's put this here. Periphery. The outer part of the organization. All right? Periphery. Neither good nor bad. The opposite of periphery is center. This is the center. So the little, little thing here is the center. The outer juicy part of the peach is the periphery. All right? Are we still there? Read up on Frederick Winslow Taylor. Yes. To learn more about Alpha. Good comment. Yes. We've been riding the horse of command and control for 100 years. So, of course, if, if I explain to you how Alpha works, you would just nod and you, you would know everything about it. This is rather more 
it's it's rather rather fresh. What I'm trying here actually is to offer you useful distinctions, as Gregory Bateson would say, useful distinctions to make sense of an entirely different way of organizing. And believe it or not, don't believe in what I'm saying, this is an entirely way, different way of organizing. No steering from the inside out, but this kind of organization gets steered from the outside in. So the periphery gets steered first, and then the periphery steers the center in the organization. In a beta organization like, like Handelsbank, you might say that there are no departments. By the way, department, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I suppose that the name department comes from departed, right? The word department comes from departed, dead, deceased. Yeah? So no departed people here. People are part of cells, and every cell would contain just one team. So up to eight people, maybe, not, probably not more, yeah? maximum team size. So this is the future of organizing. Why? Not because I'm saying so, but because markets have turned red. And annoyingly for command and control or tailorist organizations that are still trying to steer from the inside out, when managers or the top of the pyramid tries to steer the organization, that is like putting a counterforce on market steering. So the markets exert power on, on organizations, complex markets exert power on organizations. And if you try to steer against that, boom, the company will go, or whatever organization is, will go bankrupt or whatever it is, scandals may happen. We've had in Germany, of course, we have wonderful stories of scandals uh, around this. But I think every all of our countries had this, this kind of, for example, accounting scandal or you have people, you know, in sales departments bribing clients or potential clients, you know, to meet their targets, which are, of course, they are obliged to meet their targets by the incentive systems, and it makes total sense to, is to them. Yeah. So, in a way, the steering is just counter steering against the market, and in complex market that leads to collapse. We have seen this kind of collapse in software development, very drastically, very dramatically, I think. But we actually, all organizations have seen it in all their functions, in all their lines of business. This kind of collapse of command and control logic and systems uh, organizations, we've seen it happening for decades now. Take quiet quitting. I would say that quiet quitting befalls alpha organizations because they suck. And it's totally logic if you, if you force, for example, sales, salespeople to meet certain numbers, but the market tells you to do things in a different way. You still have to meet your numbers. And very strange people, uh, very strange behaviors will happen. Again, I assume and I would argue and I invite you to think and believe that people are not the problem. People are not the problem. Pant people are not the problem. Our way of organizing this, the traditional command and control way of organizing, here the pyramid model. The pyramid model sucks. Yeah. Here's the thing, every organization could transform and should transform. If I'm right and com command and control organizing was perfect for a blue world, but in a red world of complexity, we need decentralization of decision-making to the periphery, decentralized, we need decentralized organization, self-organization, this kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, whereas we are much more used to centralization and steering and not really self-organization yeah but centralized steering right from the inside out or from the top down we are used to incentives fixed targets performance appraisal the bullshit methods all kind of bullshit methods we are so used to them it's like heroin for us yeah Beautiful stuff. So, in order to transform organizations from command and control pyramid to self organized, decentralized peach, let's call this transformation and more specifically beta transformation, because this is alpha, this is beta, it's called like this for a moment. In order to transform, we have to get rid of certain bullshit tools the budgeting, the centralized steering, performance appraisal, sales departments, by the way. Salespeople are not the problem, but sales departments are. HR people are not the problem, but HR departments are. And some tools are just rigorously part of the problem. Of course, everything related to uh, waterfall as well. 
I doubt that scaled agile frameworks or scaling frameworks are very much part of this world. Right. I think they are perfect to beautify command and control organizations, but I have doubts that they will be useful in this kind of way. But don't believe what I'm saying. We have new tools coming up for the world of command and control every single day. Lots of tools out here. There are some tools in this world as well that you can use in this world. There are some tools that you can even use in both worlds. Don't believe in what I'm saying. Let's, shall we go pick up a couple of questions? You've got, you've got one. Good time. Yeah. You, so, do you want to read it out for me? Yeah, the question from Michael is, why should managers and the top level change to self-organization? They may yes. make themselves redundant. Yes, yes. Because they, they, they are winners of this model seemingly, right? Of course they are not. But I think this is the, the perfect question to begin with, because I think, but let me put this different. This is not new. This is old stuff. This is old, but this is also old. We published a paper a couple of, a year ago, Silke and myself, it's called The Invention of Managements to make clear that there are two ways of managing organization. We prefer not to call this managing, but yeah. This paper outlines that, of course, there were pioneers like Frederick Taylor responsible for creating this kind of model. At the time, that wasn't bad. It was a great solution for you know, the industrial age. This model was perfect for the industrial age indeed. And at the same time, there were other pioneers. And in the paper, we explain why there's one specific pioneer that should be you know, honored for having invented this model over 100 years ago. And her name is Mary Parker Follett. So this model, the theory behind it, but also the practice behind it, is over uh, 100 years old. This is not new shit. This is old shit, but it works. And this has ceased to work. By the way, if Frederick Taylor were alive today, he wouldn't advocate this model. Surely not. He was a very smart, even very, you know, he had a social ideology behind his work. He wanted to improve organization for the sake of everyone, societies and workers alike, you know. So he would clearly advocate this model. I cannot prove that, unfortunately. Um, you cannot prove the contrary, but still, it is obvious, I think, but don't believe what I'm saying, that in complexity, this model, and with actually human beings, this model is far superior than this model. So why are we seeing so little change? And the usual, usual answer, and uh, Martin, I think, is hinting at that, is the usual answer that we get, why do we see so few beta organizations, peach organizations? Handelsbank, Toyota, Southwest Airlines, W. Gore, Aldi, and so on. The list is short, yeah? And most organizations are still stuck in command control. So managers, they must hate beta. They must be afraid of losing something, power and so on, stuff if transformation happens. Here's the thing. I like to, I like to use a little metaphor to explain this. If you have little children, little children below 10, 10 years, below 12, up to 12 years or so, then of course the parents, as parents, you can always make the decisions around where to go for holidays, right? Where to, where to, where to go? Where to, let's have a trip to what's it, Australia or, or Bath or Bristol, yeah? You can decide because the children are so small, so cute, but they cannot make up their minds, you know? They want to be entertained and so on. They get when they are not satisfied, but you cannot really discuss, seriously discuss with them where to go. Now, then they turn 13, 14, 15, and then the game changes as parents. That sucks, right? You lose your power. You cannot make the decision by yourself. You have to share freaking decisions with your freaking children, you know, and have to discuss and, and, and make up your minds. Of course, if you look at it from a realistic point of view, nobody loses power in this, in this change of, you know, dynamics, of group dynamics. Everybody wins. Together, you become smarter, which is why Ukraine will win the war and not Russia. Because in authoritarianism, everybody loses. Everybody is a loser. Mr. Putin is a big loser. Mr. Zelensky, not so much. I mean, he can still make terrible mistakes eventually, but in a democracy, you use more collective intelligence. You are capable of using more collective, like in a market economy as well. You use more collective intelligence. So everybody 
wins. And this is the thing, at least that's what Martin, you don't have to believe, of course, in, in what I'm saying, and none of you has to believe it. I, I have been selling this shit to clients, command and control managers, right? Owners, company owners sometimes, and but certainly managed CEOs, general managers and so on. And I'm telling them, you win the most. You don't lose anything. The only thing that you will lose is the illusion of control. And this is the, the thing. In today's world, people at the top only have the illusion of control. They don't have real control. They are just blinded by, not by science. They are blinded by you know, command and control systems. And the, of course, the crazy plays that are being put on stage uh, in command and control organizations. So the only the managers in this transformation do not lose actual control. They just lose the, lose, lose the illusion control and they end up having more control by, by and large not. They actually, because transparency goes up in this kind of organization, everybody has more control, everybody, everybody. It's like, it's power is not a zero sum game. In this model, everybody has more power literally everybody. And of course, in this model, you cannot win. You end up spending your life in silly meetings and stupid and stupid illusion of decision-making and so on. There's so many stupidities in this kind of model. I like to tell my clients, well, after, after the transformation, which takes 90 days usually with the right approach, which is called open space beta, this kind of promotion, uh, transformation doesn't take years. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take many years, it takes just a few months. So after this transformation, I promise my clients, you will have much more time. You will be able to invest your time in real business problems and yeah, not waste your time in stupid, you know, stupid steering, stupid steering, stupid processes, stupid meetings. Top managers are the ultimate winners of this. And we must approach it like this. By the way, Martin, this is for you. In order to offer this kind of transformation from alpha to beta, from pyramid to peach, from centralization to decentralization. If you want to sell this eventually or do this in your organization, of course, there are consultants, trainers, coaches. If you want to sell this, if you are in an organization, if you want to do this in your organization, keep this in mind. Everybody hates alpha and everybody loves beta. Everybody loves beta. Everybody, including top managers, hates alpha. Why? You might ask. Everybody suffers from alpha. This works for no one. Of course, many people are perfectly adapted or they have had their careers and they are thankful to be alpha, but that doesn't mean they love it. That doesn't mean it makes sense to them. Okay? Martin, does this make some sense? We don't have to agree, anyways. Not even Martin has to agree, even though I love him I, and, and, and we have the greatest. I, I, actually, I actually totally, yeah. totally agree with you. Nils, I mean, the, the, the stuff you've been talking about resonates. I've got the Beta Codex website up here, and I'm looking at the white papers and the, 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 the other content around it, and I'm going to have to consume a whole bunch a whole bunch of content. Please do so. Because we the need the power of you, you, you personally and Scrum.org, for example, to sell this file. Because uh, the, the, uh, we don't have to go into this deeply, but I think the real problem is that we are not selling this to managers. Yep. That's the only problem. The problem is not that managers do not want it, but which is why Martin's question was so brilliant. I think this is the ultimate misperception. Oh, managers will hate it. No, everybody loves it. But we don't We don't have to agree. Uh, other questions? Um, Seth, do you want to read yeah. out another question? There's a few, Niels. Um, I'm just going to scroll back up because there's some coming in now. Yeah. There's a nice one here. It says, is there a relationship between this approach and holacracy? I'm assuming we're talking about the peach model here. Is there, yes, this approach and holacracy, yes. Yeah, or sociocracy. Yeah. So yes, or sociocracy. Here's the thing, and you may not like it. Sociocracy is command and control reloaded. It's a bunch of rules and meeting structures and consent-based decision-making put on top of an organization. Nothing, is, nothing has to go away. Nothing has to be, you know, nothing has to change. You just put this meeting structures and this rule based role based system and so on on top so people waste that time waste more time and more so you have the spotify model and you put holacracy on top and you put more matrix structure on top and a little bit of address okay? do you think that that can work it's more complicatedness but nothing none of that brings out complexity 
Here's the thing, in a complex world, we can only fight complexity with complexity. How do we fight complexity with complexity? We have to give people power. If we want to fight market complexity, and market complexity is a fact. Don't believe what I'm saying, but it's a fact. So, so if markets are complex, things change all the time. The markets surprise us with surprises all the time. So we must have we must create ideas to 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 solve complex, hairy problems. You know, the only way to confront complexity effectively is to have everybody think. And this model is perfect to make everybody think. The center and the periphery. The periphery serves the market, the center serves the periphery. That means everybody has to think. Nobody is steered. Nobody has a budget. Nobody has fixed targets. Every team, every cell should have, must have profit and loss statement, a PL. And the whole organization, of course, will have a PL, right? Every team has a profit and loss statement. They must all be in a, we're talking about companies with profit that needs to create a profit, all right? In a not-for-profit organization, this is slightly different, but still very similar. Every cell in, in such a kind of organization has and needs a profit and loss statement to know where they are, to, you know, to adjust to circumstances, uh, to run the business. Even central cells have a profit and loss statement, and they get paid by the periphery, while the periphery get paid by external clients. If you have this kind of system, everybody is forced to think and act and think and act and think and act all the time, which is why this kind of organization doesn't need fucking strategy. Strategy is also command and control bullshit done once a year or twice a year or whatever. Strategy sucks. It's have a few people think once a year. How can that work? This kind of organization, Handelsbank, Toyota, Aldi, Southwest Airlines, WGO, et cetera. Botsov, of course, is a great, great example of such an organization. Uh, in such an organization, everybody thinks and acts, thinking and acting all the time. And then you have things like Kaizen, of course, yeah? Improve the work all the time. Improve the business all the time. Is this still related to the question? I wonder. But I don't yes. remember the question. Seth, give me another one. Maybe. No, that's a good one. That's a good one. So Lou may have pronounced that correctly. Ah, is asking, holacracy is, and sociocracy. Uh, clearly no, no, no. No, no. Is, is there any case when moving from alpha to beta didn't work? Um, probably. I don't remember any, but it could be, yes. Well, yes, I, I experienced a couple. I, I think I'm, I am the person in the world that caused this kind of, uh, how is it, to lose this kind of, I'm, I'm the world champion in helping clients trying to transform without getting it done. I'm the world champion in that, yeah? But then we figured out how to finally do it. By the way, I did that for, with a Beyond Budgeting Round table. We first, we figured out, okay, if Handelsbanken and Toyota and this kind of fantastic company, Botsorg, Botsorg, I think from the Netherlands is one of the best cases in the world that has come up over the last 10, 15 years. If this kind of organization exists and most are command control and this is bullshit and this works and they have to transform, this is the, the real problem. The real problem is not to understand this model. This is also a problem. I write books about that, you know, so you can learn about this, but you know, and Martin can teach you uh, because he's starting to think about this as well, I see. So you can, you find a lot of stuff about this. For example, cases and books about Toyota, tons in the market. Now, what's the sad problem? That hasn't changed shit, you know? Knowledge about Toyota or Semco from Brazil, we have a Brazilian here. Huh? Knowledge about this model hasn't changed shit. So why is that? Okay, managers might be afraid of losing something, we discussed that. Or you might say, oh, my people are too dumb, we are not ready, our maturity model, the consultant says we will only be there in 20 years. The thing is, you need the right approach. And here's the thing. Oh, this, by the way, is beautiful. From Scrum, I have a lot of criticism about Scrum. What I hate most about Scrum is that it hasn't evolved. It was born brilliantly, and since then, it hasn't improved. I think that sucks. It was born brilliant, and then it should have improved every year, every four years or so, but it isn't really improving as fast as I would like. 
Scrum says, fuck you, Niels, your expectations. I don't give a shit. That's okay. But here's the thing. One, the most beautiful thing that we I learned from Scrum. I hope it's really part of Scrum. Is it is time boxing part of Scrum, Martin? Oh, yeah. Otherwise, I would have appeared to be very ignorant, right? Totally stupid. Okay, so that's one of the that's one of the brilliant, most brilliant thing. When I first heard about time boxing, I thought, oh, this is interesting. You know, to be, make people more aware that time goes on and there is a limit to the time box. And so, so either we do it until then or all is lost. In a way. So here's the thing, change management has never worked. And that is why I failed brilliantly for 15 years in attempting this kind of change. I didn't know that you had to fucking time box a change, but it's the truth. You have to fucking time box a change. If you do not, Fucking time box to change. Transformation Thanks, will never work. Questions, comments? I yes. just, How long yeah, add, if you don't if you don't time box it, it just takes forever. Yes, and forever means your client, yes. my client, will will leave the company for some fucked up reason. So everything collapses. Or you have, you know, people cannot handle that the reality is still shit, and you keep telling them about great paradise out there, you know, Toyota and so on. It doesn't work. It cannot take forever. People, people will not, there is no energy. You need to time box fucking change, transformation. Otherwise it's bullshit. And I, we, I got this, we got this from idea from the great Daniel Mezik. In the United States of America, the great Daniel Mezik, he created a concept. Some of you probably know him, right? He's a, he's a difficult guy, but he's brilliant. Yeah, he had this idea. I love him, by the way, but he's a difficult guy to work with. But still, I love him and so on. And, 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 and he had this brilliant idea. Let's time box the fucking change. And how do you do that? You need scale of a method to, end it, to begin it and to end it. it it's, if the change is not just about an agile team, a scrum team, but about hundreds or thousands of people, or maybe tens of thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, maybe a hundred thousand people, how do you begin and end it? How do you time box it? Let's do open space. Let's do go to open spaces. Let's begin an open space. Let's end an open space with 90 days in between. So the perfect time box, don't believe what I'm saying here, but it's true. The perfect, it's not perfect. Okay, it could be 92 days, but a good size of the time box to transform any organization here that transform it is 90 days. 14 days, like in what you usually would recommend in Scrum, it's not enough. You know, you cannot, you cannot. It would be too too short a time box to transform an entire organization. But Ninety days, it's pretty feasible. Don't believe what I'm saying. Read the book. You don't have to read it. Of course, there's a lot of information out there in the website. Don't read. Don't believe what I'm saying. Read it. Think about it. Reflect about it. Eventually, buy the book because in the book there are lots of details. How to do it. But here's the thing: ninety days in between. So this way. The whole transformation, you know, with a little starting, you know, preparing for the first open space and a little bit of, you know, breathing time, resonance time, as we call it. Uh, this takes just half a year, guaranteed, 180 days, guaranteed. A whole chapter, as we call it, of open space beta takes 180 days, guaranteed, because we time box everything. Everything here in this process is time boxed. This way, it will not fizzle out, fade away. Your client can handle it. And here's an additional trick. I have to share this even if you didn't ask me. There's another secret, secret ingredient to this kind of transformation. Voluntariness. And there's one, this is another thing we learned from Daniel Mazik. You need to make this voluntary. How do you do this, right? The secret is you create invitation. Only if you have invitation not forcing or bribing. By the way, is safe done by invitation? Is agile scaling done by invitation? Is even Scrum implemented by invitation? The answer is no. Usually fucking not, right? Maybe for the pilot team or group or whatever, it's voluntary, but for the others, no, no, it's coercion. So if you do this by invitation, of course you need one thing to do invitation. You need a sponsor, something like the CEO or a general manager to write an invitation that can be accepted or declined, then people who accept the invitation come to open space one and the sponsor 
authorizes with their arrival or with their participation in open space one the sponsor authorizes all the willing everybody who shows up that they will together with her or him transform the organization for a period of nine days then will they will do a giant retrospective another open space meeting after nine days this is how transformation can work don't believe what i'm saying but before we had this it never really worked we never pulled transformation off i mean i i made a living still but we never pulled it off with this transformation approach we have pulled it off every time and here's the thing you don't have to be a genius to do it you have to be careful you have to know a few things but this is doable even if you are not a genius yeah? this is open source methodology you don't have to ask me to do it you don't have to get certified by me because we can teach you and so you we write, write books and so but you don't have to ask me for permission you don't have to learn it from me yeah this can be done and why is it so feasible because it takes just core of it, it takes just 90 days and then it's done there are more details to this by the way oh by the way how does this work oh i have to add one more thing because uh, then then um, then our host here can ask you another question please but here's one more secret ingredient not so secret this is based upon one very important assumption there are two approaches to change. One is work the people. Work the people. People are the problem. So you need to develop and coach them and train them and force or bribe them and roll out and get them in the boat, incentivize them, force them again, coerce them again, throw them out of the window, whatever. You know, People are the problem. People are the problem in this approach. Now, the problem with work the people approaches like change management, with this, which is basically about working your people, it takes forever. It takes, it takes a certain time for 10 to do it with 10 people. And with 10,000 people, it might take 100 times or 1,000 times more longer, right? Because you have to change so many people. Work the people, you know, and by the way, work the people doesn't solve the problem. What did I tell you what the problem is, Martin? This is a test question. What did I tell you what the real problem is in Alpha organization? I said it's not people, it is the. Martin, are you there? Yeah, I am here. I'm just trying to remember what you what you what you what you said. <laughs> I, I remember it wasn't the people. It's not the people. Exactly. People are not the problem. What is the problem? Anybody else? Any guesses? System, the system. I said the system is the problem. Alpha organization is the problem. So this is the alternative approach. Do not try to change people, try to change, not try to change, change the system. We call that change as flipping. Flip the system instead of educating, correcting, punishing, forcing, bribing, seducing, motivating, which doesn't work, people, okay? People are not the problem. If you change the system, people will change all by themselves. It sounds like a romantic song, right? Uh, people will change if you change the system. You can change the system. Some more people will change even more. So imagine transformation from alpha to beta as thoughtful flipping of the system, not once, but maybe 7,000 times. If you do that, then transformation takes just 90 days. Questions? Seth? Will you do the others and help me with questions? Yeah, I hope yeah. I'm not talking too much, but I, I want, want to. Ah, fantastic. fantastic. That was a good one. I, okay. I managed to find it in amongst all the other comments. So Alpha has an easy track for promotion, right? The pyramid, and hence increases pay. How does an individual progress and increase their pay? Obviously, in the, in the beta, in the beta model. How does that work? That was too much Scottish in that. I didn't. I didn't Shall, do that again? Shall I translate? Yes, please. I'll, I'll, transla I'll translate for you, Seth, there. Um, he, the, the, the question was around in alpha organizations, people have a logical track for promotion yes. and increasing their salary, increasing, yes. I guess, their importance, right? That's yes. part of that story. Yes. What's the equivalent within, or uh, let, let me rephrase that instead of saying just the equivalent, what's yeah. the thing you do instead? Yes. Yes. Funny thing, when Seth said it, I didn't understand 
anything. I didn't. I didn't have a hunch of what the topic was. So. Uh, <laughs> First time I was in Scotland, somebody asked me something on the street. Until this day, I do not know what he was asking. He was also drunk, but I, still, I, mean, I think that was, wasn't part of it. It's actually because Martin has a rubbish Scottish accent. Yes, he's terrible. He's I, too, he, he doesn't master the Scottish I, accent. I just got asked today by somebody I met on the street, where are you from? Oh, and that's and I was like, Scotland. Scotland. And they're like, yeah. what? So yes, yeah, you're fake Scott, right? I'm a I fake Scott. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Korea, yes, yes, that's a tricky one. Um, but of course, people at Toyota and Handelsbanken and so on at Burzog, they also have Korea. So there must be a solution in beta that's different from alpha, right? Because of, and, and the, the the importance of the question is that obviously a great barrier to transformation seems to think that people in alpha organizations get career promises based on certain assumptions on a lot of hierarchy, career tracks and that kind of bullshit. So yes, if you do transformation, you must compensate. You must, you must offer people, of, of course you must, you will break some people's expectations maybe, um, that might really happen. So you have to think about how to heal those wounds and how to compensate for that. But of course there's a way to have a career here as well. And one might call it a role career or um, responsibility career, not a hierarchical career necessarily. I will give you an example from Handelsbanken. Usually when people join Handelsbanken, they are not so old, but they get old there and still work there because other banks, you know, not so cool. So of course I asked people at Handelsbanken also about at Toyota about this career thing. Yeah. And what they told me is that they had certainly in Handelsbanken, it is more normal to jump from different roles to different roles, which can be better paid. Oh, let's say the the in, let's put it differently in a slightly simpler way. You have, you can still have a career, but it's not based on hierarchical position or, you know, reporting spans, spans of control, you know, underlings that you have under your, under you. This is more about some roles are higher valued in, in the world and in the world of beta organizations than other roles. So imagine you, somebody wants to double her or his basic base salary, uh, then you would have to say, you would have to have discussions. Okay, you have these roles today. If you want to double your salary, you would have to perform roles that are more valuable to our organization, to our bank, for example, you know? So how do you get rid of the roles that are cheaper, less valuable? How do you assume roles that are more valuable? You know, what kind of switch would be required? What kind of position or other roles in the organization might be, might be suitable for you? So, so career discussions are not that complicated really in beta. Um, some organizations like Google, they were a beta organization for a long time. I'm not sure if they are still, you know, but at the time when my ex-wife worked there, uh, she also told me that internally people at Google had different titles, role titles. Roles are a big thing in beta. Yeah? Positions, not so much. Positions are an alpha thingy, but roles are very important in, in beta. So often at Google, people would, would have an internal title associated with their role and externally they would have something like a fake title for example head of sales that's a typical bullshit title from the alpha world right or country manager typical bullshit title that you need here on the business card and on linkedin but it doesn't make sense it does it's it doesn't say much about the work so beta organizations can have duality between these roles and titles they they do not need to promote people to pay them more People can slip into more valuable roles. And if the roles stick, if that works, they can have higher salary. It works. So promotion is really more of an alpha thing and less of a beta thing. Role careers are very much a beta thing. Does could, that make sense? Could you? It's really it does make, So many things to say it, about it. Yep. It does make sense. I, and I wondered if um, I've been doing a lot of research recently around the difference between hierarchies of control and hierarchies of competence yes and e even even when humans are just interacting with each other we def naturally defer to somebody that we believe has higher skill and capability within that context yes and that would be a hierarchy of, of competence yes and does that make sense yes but here, this is an additional thing just for you or for those interested in that matter uh, martin Competence, I think, is a, also a word from the world of alpha. 
it's a vague, fluffy, not so well distinguishable term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other words. Capability? Uh, yeah, capability, not so much either. Remember the, the blue, sorry, the blue and the red, right? Blue and the red. In the red, I said we need people with ideas. You know, we need ideas to solve complex problems. In the realm of the blue, we need knowledge. Okay, so in short, blue problems can be solved with knowledge. People with ideas, we say these are people with mastery. This is the term that we prefer to make it more okay. clear. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, that's what I mean by the term competence. Exactly, exactly. But it's just it's just a way to express things more more, more crisply yeah. in a way. Yeah. So the holder of knowledge, we usually call them experts. Experts yeah. are valuable if you have to solve blue problems. All right. If you have red problems to solve, you need people with mastery or master. Oh. Right. And this is a it's it's pretty helpful. And 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 uh, of course, Martin, what you said is totally right. Sometimes in an organization, you have a hairy problem and you know, oh my God, fuck. In this situation, we are so fucked. It's only Singh who can solve this problem. Everybody else cannot do it because only Singh has a master, you know, or, or Raj or Michael or Julian or Stephanie, you know. We always, we have, we, there is a secret knowledge in organizations about who has the mastery for certain problems. You can never yeah. find this in a database because people with mastery, when they start working on a rest problem, they do not know how to solve the problem. The how is known in, in the realm of the blue, but in the red, you can only ask who can solve the problem. And yeah. the answer is usually Raj, Singh, Stephanie, yeah? In the how you can find a process, a workbook, an algorithm, a rule, you know. Not bad, it's important. Experts are also important, but an expert only tells you how to do it. Yeah, interesting stuff. So we prefer these words mastery and you know, knowledge or master and expertise, you know, to distinguish different capabilities, so to speak. Yeah, I th I th I I think I, I'm having I'm having a lot of red thoughts, but framing it within a blue context. And and sometimes it's very useful to distinguish the two. That's why I'm writing this. Yeah. You know? uh, that's why I'm, I'm you know, that's why I always. Here's by the way the the thing. Maybe you noticed. Every time you ask a question, I go back to a model, a distinction between left and. Sometimes yep. it's good or bad. Not here on this side. Yeah, but. Whenever we want to solve problems, I think we should always go back to theory. I'm trying to make the theory explicit here on this page and on the other pages. Great. Other questions? Um, there, are, there are a few. Uh, you got about 10 minutes, just so you know, and then I, I'll wrap it up. So Where does the time go? Maybe 15 minutes? Is 15 minutes okay as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll need a few minutes at the end just to close out the session. So okay. I, can, I can be generous with that. There have been some other nice comments and uh, questions similarly related to what we we're talking about around progressing in pay but i think it's the same theme there's a nice sort of comment here from jim sort of a question i think because he's added a question mark so when you were talking about the beta sort of model yes. jim made the comment that is it a bit like you know like value contribution so basically valuing the contribution as perceived by a customer or organization which i think is a valuable yes. comment Yes, and this this model on the right is all about value creation. This is about hierarchical power. Hmm. It's about top and bottom. This is about outside inside. And of course, in a in a in in an org chart, you do not see where value creation flows, how process flows. It's almost impossible to to the process of value creation here. But this is really about how does value flow from a team in the center to a team in the periphery to the external client. How does this work? So, and here's the thing, when a periphery cell, cell creates value to an external client, that client will be willing to pay for an invoice. Yeah. So there's payment, there's value creation from the inside out and from the outside in, there is an invoice being paid. So money flows inside to the cell of the periphery. 
And then the center can create value for the periphery cell here and get paid in exchange. In a way, this model of cells in the periphery and cells in the center is exactly like a market economy. Whereas this is Soviet Union planned economy, which by the way, never worked. Surprise, surprise. Which is why budgeting, annual planning, several year planning, strategic planning, long-term, short-term, career planning, all this planning, 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 cannot really work as we know in complexity. Yeah. So the alternative is really to, and this is a big shift. I think that most people, I mean, there are many models, concepts talking about this kind of world, this kind of organization, right? Look at Frederick Laloux's book, uh, Reinventing Organization. He sketches this kind of model as well in a, in a way. But Frederick's passion doesn't seem so to be so much in economics, in the, let's say, in the monetary uh, element of this. How to, and also Scrum, I think, is deaf and blind on the economic side of work and value creation. It shouldn't be. I think Scrum teams should get paid for, for delivering certain value points of certain features or certain story points or so. Yeah, they should get paid and should be left left alone most of the time. You know, you don't have to steer them if they can, you know, build up resources, reduce resources, have their own, you know, economic gain going on, their own profit and loss thing going on. That is how this kind of organization works. And here's a detail that many authors, many concepts ignore. And that is in this kind of organization, alpha organization, it's the top that has the money. It's the CEO, the CFO, they have the money, right? They have power. Now, in this model, what, who do you think has the money? Who has the power? Inside the organization is the periphery, right? Yes. Cells in the periphery have the money. At Handelsbanken, the branches have the money, or at DM, a large uh, retail chain of drugstore, drugstore chain, they have more than 60,000 people. I think 60,000 people by a lot or 70,000 maybe already. The branch as the branches have money. So if you want to have, if we want to build a new, create a new branch, you need investment from all the branches. You cannot get money from the CEO or the CFO because they don't have the money. Money is in the other branches. The periphery is in charge. Imagine tech investment. Oh, somebody in the center wants to invest in servers, and new hardware or software, what, whatever. Where do you get the money? You have to, have to ask the periphery for money. So it's a totally different game. Very democratic, really. very. And by the way, this could be called democracy. Yeah, and how do we want to call the left? Authoritarianism or just fascism or Stalinism? Choose your rant, right? It has different flavors, authoritarianism. Yeah. But this is clearly not democratic. Yeah. Other questions? If we can, if you like. No, this time, this time, there's two. I'm going to finish with one, which I think is probably a nice one for you to end with. All so right. Scott's just dropped one in now. He's asking, liberating structures, blue or red? Sure, Martin might have a view on this as well, but what are your thoughts, Neil? Liberating structures. It's a bunch of facilitation methods, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, interaction measurements. For example, open space would be interaction uh, methods. Actually, yeah. Uh, yeah. Op open space would be in that category. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And um, in a way, the brilliance of liberating structures is that it made people, made agilists, especially getting interested in facilitation. You know, actual facilitation techniques. It's nothing new, but uh, still, of course, this is very much around social interaction. I wish that liberating structures would focus more on, you know, making transformation supporting transformation then, you know, just because much of liberating structures is done for people to, in alpha organization, feel better. It's like corporate therapy, that kind of stuff, you know, and, and I think that shouldn't be the clue, but, but clearly, of course, liberating structures are about social interaction, about human interaction in groups, even large groups, and that's clearly a red, dominant, predominantly a red problem. Not a, blue problem. a blue problem is accounting. Uh, Make make uh, make contracts, set up contracts, set up proposals. That's those are blue problems, uh, and, and liberating structures clearly clearly dedicated to social interaction, less red stuff. Yeah, I would, I would probably say that liberating structures themselves don't have a dog in the race, right? 
they, 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 they will work just as effectively in either environment, yeah. Yes, but I would argue that it's, it's a little bit the same that I would criticize about you know, um, other techniques, design thinking, or even Scrum. In an alpha context, it serves the beautification or the optimization of the wrong yep. model. And yep. forgive me if I'm blunt and I'm no. They seem negative, right. but I think we should we should we should use liberating structures to make transformation happen. That's why we employ open space to do fucking transformation and not just some playing around, fiddling around. You know, bunch of you know, if we do too much beautiful things here, like design thinking, liberating structures, yeah. we become happy hypocrites. Not happy hippopotamus, but happy hypocrites. And I think we shouldn't do that. You know, of course. It's okay to give people a happy time here, but the our 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 intent should be to, and of course, in a way, a beta organization needs less officially liberating structures because people can enjoy the work. That's one of we didn't go much into that, but in this model, you can just work and enjoy that, and work works, and it's not stifled by command department meetings and. and uh, Steering committees and that kind of bullshit and budgets. So, in a way, this is not about this, should be called liberating work. This model. Thank you. Great, great comment. Thank you, Matt. That was good. So, right, okay. okay. We've, got, we've got time for one more. This is a good one. This, this is perfect for unions. Okay. Michael's asking, where, so he said, first on a personal level, where to start with Vita Codex on a personal level, but then he's rightly refined his question to say on a practical level. How does one start with the Vita Codex on a practical level? Where would you advise and recommend people begin with this stuff? Yeah, yes. Um, two, two approaches, I think. One is, one is to thinking. Um, I mean, if you look at our, our session here, it took um, 70 minutes or so, 72 minutes or so until now. And what I have done with you is I have tried to suggest distinctions that make it possible to see what's previously unnoticeable. That's what science does as well. But these distinctions between alpha and beta, center and periphery, the blue and the red, between steering or centralization and decentralization and so on, these dis or between a cell and a department. I mean, I often suggested a lot of distinctions to you. And I believe that is one of the first steps. Introduce these distinctions in the daily work, confront people with that. For example, asking in a meeting, you might ask, is this really a blue problem or isn't this a red problem now? Are we approaching this right? That might be a nice, a nice way to, to uh, stir up a meeting that's really boring and really improductive, you know, and to, to introduce these. Or is, is, this, is this an alpha way of us doing this or are we trying to do it in a beta way? Those, those could be really nice, nice things. So one of the things is to use these distinctions in your work. Another way is to propose flipping, to propose flips. I told you that to transform an organization, you need approximately 7,000. Or well, there might be 1,000, it's, 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 it's a lot already, but 5,000 is good too. But there might be 8,000 flips to do. But again, it depends. If you're in uh, the NHS, in the UK, you need probably 8,000 flips, but never mind. One thing to approach this is to start flipping. For example, abolish budgeting. Most finance people hate budgeting. They cannot imagine getting rid of it, some of them, but some of them can. So stir it up. Invite HR people to abolish performance appraisal. A, a performance appraisal is the world's worst command and control alpha shit that you can imagine. It's the most useless pile of dung that can be done. So getting rid of that, getting rid of shitty tools and traditions and forms, Get rid of the travel policy. It's oh, it's it's a useful blue tool for a red problem. Travel is a red problem for organization. So getting rid of useless tools, useless processes, useless rules. We call that organizational hygiene. So that is a way to get started. So even the most pessimistic manager, you can tell you can tell him or her. How about trying a little bit of organizational, how to wash, how to cleanse the organization a little bit, throw out some garbage, yeah? some garbage processes, finance processes, or HR processes, or 
rules, I mean, organization are full, uh, full of rules, you know, or institutions or meetings or um, committees. Oh my God, every committee in the world is a useless pile of shit. So eliminate a committee. That's a first flip. Sorry for being so dramatic. I, I love I love swearing in English. <laughs> I just love it. And I I, I did. I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it. Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. Organizational hygiene. That's one of the ways. Start with organizational hygiene to get into the mood. Because here's the thing. One of them, there's a brilliant guy in Canada. This guy who created Agile Change Management. How is it? How is it what's his name? This lovely guy. He, he has this axiom that the easiest thing, if you want to change your clothing, is to take something off. If you want to transform, put something away is the easiest thing. You know? Instead of dressing up with something new, put something away. Organizations have zero experience with organizational hygiene. I always experience that. Zero experience. They don't know how to put bad stuff away. Nothing is ever eliminated and abolished in organizations. So this is something I learned. Many of the flips that you must do to get from alpha to beta is organizational hygiene flips. Flip bullshit away. Put it on the garbage heap of history. Put it into the museum. You can even create a museum of you know eliminated bullshit practices. You know, have an icon for performance appraisal and symbols, you know, statues for these things. And have a museum of bullshit that, that we got rid of, strategic planning and shit. Yeah, I have a whole list of this, both in my book. There's a, a page in this book full of, full of practices that you can get rid of, but you can find this on the internet. Right? You don't have to buy the book, show your material. Okay, so two ways. Use the distinctions that I offer you, if you like, and propose to do organizational hygiene. Those are two great ways to get started. Without even, you know, embarrassing anyone. Brilliant. No, I think that's okay. a fantastic place to, to end. I think everybody's appreciating your suggestion around organizational hygiene. I think most of us on this call can relate to that. And I think most of us try to, you know, introduce as much of that as possible. Yeah. I myself are a, I'm a huge advocate of environments and cultures where there are less meetings. Meetings for meeting's sake kind of really, really upset me because then you can't get down to real work. So, no, absolutely fantastic. Just on the last point there, you were talking about somebody. I think Craig thought you were talking about Jason Little. Yeah, yes, Jason, Jason Little. Yeah. Exactly. I thought you were talking about Scott Ambler, but Jason Little. I don't know that man, but um, my, my regards to him. No, Maybe I was talking about Jason Little. Yes, brilliant guy. Well, listen, Niels, I, I'm going to bring it there because that leaves me two minutes and that's all I need. I didn't really want to stop you because it's been an absolutely fascinating session. I think everybody thoroughly enjoyed it. You've had so much very positive response and comment um, in the chat for everything you've shared today. I think it was very engaging. So, so thank you for that. I think many of us will go away and further explore your work, which is yes. exactly why we like to invite our speakers to introduce their work to, to others. So I think you've definitely achieved that today. And I thoroughly enjoyed hosting you and, 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 and listening to your explanations. So, yeah, I think it was very, very informative, very engaging and very educational. So thank you kindly, sir. I'm going to give you a little applause there because I know it's muted. Thank you very much. You're getting a lot of positive sentiment there. It was fantastic. Um, and we will record it, everyone, and share it for those who have to drop off. Uh, and there'll be many others in our community, I'm sure, will... Um, pick up the recording once it's issued. So thank you again for joining. Thank you for taking the time. Stay in touch if you like, guys. Um, visit Betacodex.org uh, if you like. There are many, many papers that Martin already mentioned. And of course, I'm happy if you buy the books, read the books, recommend the books. And, uh, Brilliant. The other stuff that's on our Red42 website. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And um, if, you, if, if some of you enjoyed this session, you might suggest to the hosts to do it again next year with a different topic. Well, more, more than happy to have you back anytime. I would love, love to be back. Conversation about getting you back onto the program for 2023. Absolutely, we'd be honoured to do that. Uh, right, folks, I think that's us nearly up on time. Thank you all for joining. It's September. Can you believe that? So we've got a couple of sessions left for you, and Donald and I are working away on a, a nice finale for you all for the end of the year in December, TBC. But our next session was with Katrine on this fantastic book, which I love, and a, another subject that's close to my heart. This one's Selfless Leadership. That's available for October. It's already very popular. So if you want to hear more about her work um, from this book and what she's been doing, do please sign up for that. 
And then in November, we'll have a session with Caitlin Walker. And she'll be talking about living with the end in mind, which again is a, another very fascinating human session for you all. So yeah, that's what we've got lined up. Thanks again to, to Niels for his wonderful session today and for all of you for joining us and engaging in your fantastic questions. And uh, we hope we'll see you again soon. Take care. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you happen to be. Thanks, folks. Take care. Thanks, folks. Thank you.